No, shit, shit, shit. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Disconnected. I think it's behind us. What the stuff? We awoke on day number four of our journey refreshed. Despite what had been a particularly windy night, our tent hadn't moved an inch under the shelter of the thick forest canopy. After a breakfast of yogurt, granola, and hot coffee, we packed up camp and hit the road, anxious for the day ahead. The plan for the day was to retrace our steps back to Cameron and attempt to find the mystery shop before pushing on to Rusfin for fuel. From Rusfin, the idea was to head as far south on the infamous Ruta Y85 as possible, with as much fuel as we could carry. Once again, the exact end of the road was a bit of a mystery, and there would be no opportunities to refuel south of Rusfin. Upon entering Cameron, we just so happened to see Joaquin, the fellow moto enthusiast we had met the day prior. Yeah, yeah, how's it? How did it go? Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, we turned around at uh, Rio Caleta. After a quick chat, he confirmed the existence of Supermercado Patita, and despite it being closed for lunch, was nice enough to phone the owner to let her know that we were on our way. We realized supplies would be scarce on the island and packed food for the entire week. Not an easy task on a motorcycle, especially for two. Unfortunately, pickings were slim. I managed to buy a liter of milk and a bit of cheese while Chad settled for a pack of sausages and a four pack of beer. Everything a growing boy needs. After stocking up, we set our sights on Rusfin, our one and only hope for gas. Not far down the road, however, Chad spotted another fixer-upper, a rustic, charming, and cozy escape from the hustle and bustle of the rat race in real estate lingo. Ready to move in? Yep. Fresh coat of paint. That's all she needs. Go get our bags. In other words, a school bus parallel parked between an outhouse and a chicken coop. After a quick tour of the property and filling out a credit application, we were once again on the road. Great view. You don't need to pee right now. Sure you don't. You always need to pee. I gotta stop every 20 minutes so you can pee. Here's a perfectly good bathroom and now you don't use it? Nothing in this part of the world is random. Everything exists for a reason. Rusfin is no exception. Originally the site of a long abandoned alluvial gold dredge, erected under the direction of a New Zealand miner and steamboat captain in 1904, it is now the site of the island's largest sawmill and only gas station south of Porvenir. It's a combustible. Tucked away within the complex of the mill, this COPEC station has one pump for diesel and another for 93 octane gas. We could not have been happier to see that it was in operation. A week prior to our departure, we had heard rumors that the station had burnt last November. Unable to confirm if the rumors were true, it would have meant the end of our journey. Without detours, Chad had mapped out approximately 230 kilometers of riding south of Rusfin, one way. Typically squeezing around 300 kilometers out of a stock tank, we are also carrying a four liter roto pack and a six liter dromedary, which would give us approximately 460 kilometers total range. I'll let you do the math. 
But suffice it to say, we needed every last drop. Gassed up and top-heavy, we continued south battling the wind and the map on the way to Estancia Vicuña. At Pampa Wanaco, the last settlement heading south, we stopped briefly at the Comisaria Carabineros, or police station. It's not uncommon in rural areas for them to put out traffic cones, but this station had a gate and a stop sign as well. I think that just walk closed. Not seeing anyone and assuming the gate had merely blown shut, we continued on our way. Missing the sign asking us to register our entry into the region for our own safety. Oops. Gruta Y85 was originally conceived in 1978. In an attempt to connect this estancia, founded in 1915, and at the time, the southernmost established Chilean community on the island, with Yandegaya Bay, on the northern banks of the Beagle Channel. From there, a ferry across the channel would provide access to both Ushuaia and the world's southernmost city, Puerto Williams, on Navarro Island. The rugged and remote territory in between Vicuña and Yandegaya was a blank section of the map and not officially explored until the 1890s when a Chilean commission attempted to establish the boundaries with Argentina. As we approached Parque Caruquinca, the landscape gradually shifted from open pampas to thick native forest. Shortly thereafter, we excitedly pulled over to partake in one of my favorite pastimes. Rose is searching for Winona the big brown beaver. <laughs> Found her a genuine beaver dam. Can they stay under the water? Can they hold their breath? I think they live inside the dam, but I'm not sure. I think they have dens in the dam. Yeah, or maybe they just have dens around the dam. I, I'm not, I don't know. I'm no, uh, I'm no beaver expert. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Right out of a cartoon. <laughs> Look at those. Oh, you pesky beavers, you. <laughs> Everything I know uh, about beavers, I learned by watching cartoons. Beavers? Justin Bieber? Justin Bieber? <laughs> the only thing I know about Justin Beavers is what I read in the tabloids. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if they're nocturnal. I don't know if they have day jobs. <laughs> I don't know if they have like pouches like kangaroos. I don't think they're marsupials, but I don't really know. I, I just know they're mean. Yeah. All right. Well, the beaver hunt was unsuccessful. We found the lair of the beaver, <laughs> but the, the beavers fled upon our arrival. Yeah. Uh, the beavers won this round, but um, this isn't over. This isn't over. No. <laughs> One of our local friends, upon hearing our plans to explore Tierra del Fuego, made the mistake of informing me that the southern half of the island was, in his words, crawling with beaver. Chad promised to find me a beaver dam, and it didn't take long. Little did we know, there are beaver dams everywhere, and I mean everywhere. The beavers themselves, however, were a bit more elusive. Onward to Mirador Deseado and the road of a thousand switchbacks, actually 56 to be exact. We decided to take in the view and send up the drone. It was a bit windy on the pass, but hey, what could go wrong? And that's the last time we saw the drone. <laughs> Once over the valley, the wind was just too much for the drone. Losing ground and rapidly draining the battery, the drone automatically began a forced landing directly over the forest. 
I have no idea where the drone is. It's got 8% battery. It says it's returning to home. Unable to override the forced landing, Chad did his best to fly the drone over the road and away from the trees. No, 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 no. No. Landing. No, fuck. Low battery. Oh, no. No, shit, shit, shit. No, 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 no. Landing. No, 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 no. What the stuff? Hey. Keep your eye out. I am. Unbelievable. <laughs> Use the footage, the last footage that it recorded, to realize it was between some stacked up logs back there. <laughs> or after that, there it is. Oh, a little guy. On the side of the road, man. You know what? Like three feet over that way, and we never would have found it. <laughs> no, never. It would, it would have been in the bushes. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. Oh, I'm so happy. Unbelievable. Miraculously, using the last seconds of footage recorded on the phone before we lost signal, we found our little water bug just off the side of the road, approximately three kilometers from where we launched it. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. I don't know if it landed or if it fell out of the sky, but it was upright, <laughs> so. And the propellers are still attached. Aren't they like cats? They land on their feet. Construction of road, starting from the north, commenced in late 1979. However, the project was abandoned in early 1982 due to what was deemed impassable terrain. In 1994, the Chilean Military Work Corps resurrected this project with a new completion date projected for some time between 2019 and 2023. However, by 2012, only the initial 75 kilometers were complete. There's no official information available regarding the progress of the project or updated completion dates beyond 2016. We continued pushing south, through valleys, over passes, around tight switchback, over tight switchback, past the military work corps camp, and into the Sierra Dientes del Dragón. At the end of Lago Cami, crossing the mouth of the Azapardo River, we hit the fork in the road between Caleta Maria and parts unknown. From here, 
we were officially off the map. This new section of road was spectacular. Fresh road cuts, rife with rockfall, skirting the banks of Lago Cami and crisscrossing Rio Betbetter over numerous modern steel bridges. Unfortunately, the fun was short-lived. Shortly after a suggested fin de camino, we came across a much more persuasive fin de camino, complete with a locked gate and warnings of explosives in use. I guess they're serious, huh? Anticlimactic as the end of the road was, we decided not to press our luck and backtrack to find an appropriate campsite for the night. Luckily, along the banks of Rio Betbetter, next to an aforementioned bridge, we found a nice clearing with a cozy little tent site nestled in the trees. And despite being right off the road, we didn't anticipate much traffic. Not a bad little camp spot. Next to the river, we got the uh, tent tucked away in the trees here in case it uh, starts to rain again. Hey babe, say hi. Oh, did I interrupt your blowjob? She's, she's inflating the air mattress. She has to blow into it. That's her job. <laughs> You're a little lightheaded. Yeah, a little lightheaded. Just keep going. You're almost there. You're almost there. Don't stop now. <laughs> After setting up camp, a quick pipe down the river and a much needed bath. Chad was able to enjoy his hard-won beer and sausages cooked by the campfire. Day five dawned wet. After doing our best to dry out our camping gear, we wasted no time getting on the bike and retracing our steps toward Coleta Maria. As beautiful as the riding had been, Chad was disappointed with the anticlimactic Fin de Camino gate at the end of Ruta Y85. Now, having arrived at the theoretical end of the road, our only option was to ride north. Not a bad view, huh? It's beautiful. Man, look at this place. So we're right here. We just got back on the map. And see this orange line? That's the Argentinian border. So this lake actually has two names. I believe it's called Cami on this side, on the Chilean side of the border, and it's called something else on the Argentinian side. But looking across that lake right there, this portion of the lake is Chile, and back those mountains that we see there in the distance, that's Argentina. The loose plan for the day was to explore as many spur roads in the area as possible. First, to Coleta Maria, whose first occupation dates back to settlers in 1913 and was later the site of a sawmill founded in 1942, vestiges of which still remain on site. From there, back to Pampa Wanaco to explore the short routes up to Valle 
de los Castores and Lago Blanco. While not our primary objective in our search for the end of the road, Caleta Maria did not disappoint. After placing a ceremonial sticker and digging around in the register box, Chad celebrated with a donated menthol while I seriously considered assuming a new identity. Are you going to change your identity for somebody else? Rose almost got blown over. Into the road. The road ending abruptly at the shores of the windblown sound, with the mountains providing a dramatic backdrop. Caleta Maria gave us a much more appropriate venue to mark our arrival at the end of the road. After the obligatory photos and a birthday message from my mom back in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we once again set our sights north, satisfied that we had achieved some sort of symbolic victory. Back through the valley, past the beaver dams, through all 56 switchbacks and over the windblown passes, we wasted no time arriving at Estancia Vicuña. With nothing but time on our hands, we decided to stop for a quick tour of the grounds After stretching our legs, we made short order of passing through the remote outpost of Pampahuanaco and heading up to Valle de los Castores, a beautiful valley with a meandering river teeming with wild horses and Wanaco. Tempted as we were to pitch our tent in the meadow 
we elected instead to ride up to the established campgrounds at Lago Blanco. Beautiful as it was, camping here almost seemed irreverent. In short order, we found a perfect campsite just off the shore of the lake, nestled safely in the trees. Our riding days thus far had been long and tiring, so we didn't feel too guilty about taking it easy and lounging in camp. <laughs> they say smoke follows beauty, you know. Dirty underwear? Well... That's what we always say. Yeah. I think you qualify on both accounts. <laughs> One of the locals even invited himself over for dinner, providing endless okay. entertainment until we finally retired okay. to the tent. Hi. This guy's tail tucked. Testing the waters. Hi. Where you going? Look, when I start walking away, he starts coming closer to me. Come on. Come on. Peeing on the tree stump. Come on. By day six, we had really settled into a routine. We each naturally assumed the various chores of setting up camp, cooking, cleaning, and repacking the bike. It had been almost two years since Chad had ridden from California, and I joined him on the final push to Natalis along the Carretera Austral. But despite having spent a month riding two up on Ruta 7, this week on Tierra del Fuego represented the most consecutive nights we had spent in the tent together. Departing Lago Blanco, we made a customary California stop at the police station before backtracking to Rusfin for gas. After 400 kilometers, we had managed to run through the stock tank and the dromedary with the roto pack to spare. After refueling, taking them up on their offer to refill our water bottles and a bit of horsing around, we backtracked briefly to a lonely intersection on the horizon. Beyond filling the tank, the rough plan for the day was to work our way back north towards Port Venier. Chad, however, hates riding the same road twice if it can be avoided. So instead of taking the direct route and retracing our steps through Cameron and back up the coast, we decided to backtrack to our one and only other option heading north. Our only real objective for the day was to get within striking distance of Porvenir in order to catch the ferry back to the mainland the next day. Ferries only leave once a day, and we had to be in town by noon in order to ensure obtaining the correct paperwork to make the passage. Riding through the mountains the last few days had granted us relative shelter from the wind but this lonely stretch of highway on Ruta Y-79 left us completely exposed to 80-kilometer crosswinds, keeping us on our toes. Riding in strong winds like this is tiring, especially for Chad, forcing him into an unnatural position, battling to keep the bike on the road. There are more than sheep will peep here, there are more people than sheep here, 
And while these Patagonian traffic jams can grow tiresome when you have somewhere to be, they were a welcome reprieve from the monotonous winds. At a glance, the Patagonian steppe comes across as empty, a vacant expanse void of any redeeming qualities. But there is beauty here, the kind of subtle beauty that only reveals itself to those willing to search it out. Those willing to sit patiently, alone in this vast wilderness, until it reveals itself. It's a quiet beauty, hidden beauty that takes time and patience to fully appreciate. After arriving at the crossroads and taking a stern warning from the locals into consideration, we came across another roadside refugio and our first camping option for the night. There's some guy that calls himself the Peak Transat, <laughs> which is very entertaining. And it looks like just about everybody that's passed this way at one time or another has left their mark including some fairly detailed maps of Tierra del Fuego and uh, some other souvenirs. <laughs> uh, anyway, a little bit of history in here for sure. Pretty funny. And these are perfect parting words. May the wind be with you. After careful consideration, we decided to push on. Realizing the final stretch along the coast into Port Venir didn't have much to offer in terms of camping opportunities or shelter through the wind. And keeping with Chad's goal to never ride the same road twice, we elected to take a 56 kilometer scenic bypass loop through the mountains just above Port Venir. Luckily, just 20 or so kilometers outside of town, we came across the perfect campsite for a final night on the island. Well, perfect may be a bit of a stretch, but it certainly beat the refugio that was moonlighting as an outhouse. All right, here's camp number six. Unfortunately, it's just off the side of the road, and we already had some locals eyeballing us, but uh, nothing that would uh, prevent us from staying here. Nice little spot in a little uh, in a little gully here with a stream running through it. Ready, sir. Uh huh. What's up, Squeaky? You in here inflating air mattresses? Yep. Very nice. Very nice. I underinflate yours just a tad to uh... to punish me. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I've gotten used to that. <laughs> Random punishment for no rhyme or reason. But I love you. Yeah, I can tell. You torture me out of love. Our last night was certainly bittersweet. Happy that we had successfully completed our trip that had been four months in the making. We were sad that it was over. We enjoyed our final meal next to the campfire before being gently lulled to sleep by the creek. See, I told you, this is what happens when we don't uh, camp with professionals. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, stick cheese and ramen noodles. <laughs> the funny thing is, Rose is a vegetarian, uh -huh. and the only ramen flavor they had was spicy shrimp. Uh -huh. 
but luckily vegetarian. luckily there's no actual shrimp were harmed in the making of this ramen so <laughs> she's gonna have her vegetarian shrimp flavored ramen yep. looks delicious i'm not even letting you taste it since you're just insulting <laughs> no no problem i'm not gonna be too offended i'm not gonna be too heartbroken over that <laughs> By morning, our scenic loop had turned into a thoroughfare, at least by Tierra del Fuego standards. The traffic in the morning woke us up before our alarm had a chance to, and we received a few amused looks from the morning's commuters. In short order, we were back to civilization and wasted no time going about the task of applying for our travel permissions. So it accepted the return permission. Now we have to go to the C-19 and get the sanitary uh, affidavit filled out. Surprisingly, the process of obtaining our tickets for the passage had been much more involved and the procedures significantly stricter than they had been in Punta Delgada. Luckily, after crossing our T's and dotting our I's, we were on the ferry and underway. After a fairly uneventful crossing, watching Tierra del Fuego disappear in the distance, we were back on the mainland in Punta Arenas. Ready? Go forward. One, two, three. All right. Yeah, I got it. That's it. After the obligatory stop at our favorite moto shop for a quick coffee and a new chain, we were back on the highway for the final 200 kilometers of slab back to Natalis. It had been an incredible week with great riding and even better scenery. With the borders closed, preventing us from venturing to the Argentinian side of the island, we were able to explore the rarely visited corners of Chilena Tierra del Fuego. For those of you watching, considering one day making this journey, we hope that if nothing else, you learned that this island, aside from representing the symbolic end to many Pan American journeys, has so much more to offer than just Ushuaia. Somebody fell in the water. Beaver bait, your beaver bait. Oh, now you're all wet again. <laughs> Walk. Well, hurry! I'm recording. I want to see you fall in. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> Let's go, beaver hunter. I thought you were professional. <laughs>